Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for part two on qualifying and finding great tenants. Now bear in mind that I skimmed the surface of each sort of qualification process. It's actually more in depth than that, but at least this video will give you an idea of what to expect and what to do uh, if you haven't had uh, experience uh, with an investment property or even if you're experienced landlord uh, this may shed some light or you can always reach out to me if you have any questions directly on some of the topics we talked about so let's get into our first to uh, third topic actually credit scores now the general rule of thumb is having a 700 or more credit score is an acceptable uh, score where the landlord will be willing to look at as something that can be approved. Uh, obviously the higher is better. I've seen credit scores all the way up to almost 900, which is a perfect credit score. Now bear in mind, tenants that make excellent income and also uh, have super credit and, and loads and loads of savings, those generally won't be long-term tenants. Not to say that they're gonna be bad tenants, but you gotta find that median balance. So just going back to what I want to talk about is how to analyze credit scores is what's their debt load? What kind of debts do they have? How much credit utilization do they have? You know, the rule of thumb, if they're using about 30%, uh, that's acceptable. But once it goes beyond that, uh, you wanna see what kind of debt load that is. Is it a credit card debt load where interest rates are 20% or is it a school debt loan that, that they have where the interest is much uh, lower or maybe no interest at all? So an analysis of their credit debt load and what it entails, do, have they ever been bankrupt? All that is very, very important in an analysis and understanding in addition to the rental application and also the income is how do they utilize credit. So now that you've gone through the rental application, the credit scores and verifying the income, what happens next? I always recommend a phone conversation with your tenant, an interview an informal, casual conversation between your tenant and landlord. Don't forget this goes both ways. So I recommend a phone call or a virtual meeting, even better, where you can see each other face to face and you can ask any question you want in terms of obviously relating to the property itself is, do you have any questions, Mr. and Mrs. Tenant? Uh, as uh, if there's any issues, I will be your first point of contact. And if you have a property manager, let them know Mr. and Mrs. Jones will be attending to any questions you have and uh, that there's obviously an expectation to pay your rent on time and that you adhere to all the rules and regulations of the lease. So that phone conversation generally would last about maybe five or 10 minutes. It's not necessary, but I do recommend it uh, before signing on the dotted line, see who that person is uh, in reality or Oh, well, virtual reality, or at least hear them over the phone. Um, if uh, you don't you don't feel comfortable, or if the tenant doesn't feel comfortable at that moment of time to do a virtual meeting, have that phone call is uh, definitely a big recommendation. So now you've signed the residential lease, the official lease. You've given the tenant the keys. What happens next? Do you just disappear or does the tenant disappear? You don't hear from them again? No, you want to have a good relationship with your tenant, letting them know that you're here or your property manager is here uh, if there's any issues or if there's any questions. And as well, uh, what I normally recommend is, for example, if you're renting out your townhome or your single home, uh, to let them know that in a couple months time, I'm gonna give you advance notice, 24 to 48 hours written notice to change the air filter. So this is a good way, uh, the furnace filter, it's a good way to come into the home, see how they're keeping the home and uh, to see if they have any questions when you're meeting them face to face. Uh, you don't need to see or hear or talk to your tenant every day, but you wanna maintain a relationship, letting them know that you're not an absentee landlord and that you're always here to make sure that you're uh, attending to any needs that they have, uh, if there's any deficiency in the home, that uh, things that need to be fixed, that you'll be addressing them. And of course, for your own peace of mind, knowing that they are taking care of the home and they don't have unexpected pets or, or roommates that shouldn't be there. So having that landlord and tenant relationship on a periphery level is very important, especially in the beginning when they're first moving in. Over time, obviously if they've been there for two, three years, um, you don't need to go back as often. So my final thoughts on owning an investment property. 
I can tell you it's not for everyone, but investment property is a great long-term investment. It's not something you'll see in a month's time or a year's time or even two years time. But after 10 years, you have a tenant that's been paying down your mortgage and also your property value increasing. And in addition to other avenues of investments, RSPs, mutual funds, using your TFSAs to invest in a multitude of things, your insurance, real estate is one of those avenues where it's proven over the long term uh, to give you massive gains and making your money work for you. So you go to work, you make the money, and you do the same thing every day. But how do you take some of that money you save and work for you? Where even if you're sleeping at night, it helps you grow. Real estate is definitely one avenue. Thanks again for watching. Stay safe, stay active. Please subscribe to the Raymond Chin Real Estate channel and we're still selling real estate.